Hi, welcome to this fifth and final video about experiments in the digital age. This video is about the three R's, some ideas that you can use to help with more ethical experimental design. It's covered in chapter four of Bit by Bit. So I was working on this part of Bit by Bit right around the time the experiment called Emotional Contagion happened and was being debated in the field. And there was a lot of disagreement. There were some people who said experiments are without consent are never appropriate. And other t people said, oh, these are totally fine. And there was just a lot of fighting and <clears throat> it felt like not a lot of progress forward. And around this time, I was talking to one of my neighbors who's a biologist who did, it, does uh, experiments in her lab with rats. And she said, oh, we have a whole ethical framework for how to do experiments with animals. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. As I learned more about it, it seemed like a really interesting way to think some, think a little bit differently about experiments involving humans. Obviously, animals and humans, completely different. Um, however, sometimes when you take something you've thought about before in one context and move it into another context, it can um, help stimulate some fresh thinking. And so let's take, uh, so here's a picture of a kitten. Um, I think that many of us would say there are some experiments that could be done with kittens that would be completely ethically inappropriate. And I think many of us could also imagine experiments involving kittens that would be ethically permissible. And so <clears throat> maybe we can think more about these ideas of like when are experiments more or less appropriate rather than trying to come up with strong always or never appropriate. And so one way to do that is these ideas that have been developed in animal research ethics. Uh, there's a landmark book, The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique by Russell and Birch from 1959. And they talk about the three R's, replace, refine, and reduce. And so for the purposes of computational social science, we can use those three R's to help us think about digital experiments. So now I wanna go through each of these three R's in the context of a specific study. This is the Emotional Contagion Study by Kramer et al. Um, I picked this particular study not because I think it's anything like doing experiments on kittens, uh, I picked it because it's well known and it was something I was thinking about at the time I was writing this part of Bit by Bit. And I think it's something that illustrates the three R's pretty well and shows that they can help us um, think about real research in a, in a different way. Um, so briefly to review the study, um, they were interested in the effect of um, certain kinds of emotional content on people on their newsfeed and Facebook. So there were two conditions. In one condition, the researchers randomly blocked words that had negativity in them, like sad. And in another condition, the researchers randomly blocked words that have uh, po posts that have positive words, like happy. Uh, and what they found is that in the positivity reduced conditions, um, people ended up posting fewer positive words and more negative words. And in the negativity reduced condition, people ended up posting more positive words and less negative words. So this, as I said briefly, this study led to a lot of ethical debate. There was this um, expression of editorial concern published in PNAS. Um, so now let's use the th three R's to think about this experiment. So the first R, replace. So we can replace experiments with less invasive methods. So in this case, uh, prior to the um, emotional contagion experiment, there was this study uh, about detecting emotional contagion using natural experiments. So natural experiments are situations where the environment creates the experiment for you. So rather than having to make people sad, uh, you can look for a situation where nature does that for you. And so in this case, what they did is, what they found is that um, people use more negative words when it's raining. And so let's imagine you have some friends in Seattle, it's raining in Seattle, they're gonna post more negative things on Facebook, and so the question is, are you happier or sadder when it's raining in Seattle? So that's the idea. <clears throat> and so this is a way that you can study uh, emotional contagion without needing to make anyone sad yourself. You can take advantage of naturally occurring um, variation that allows you to do a natural experiment. Now, of course, 
doing natural experiments, the researchers have less control, there are a number of stronger assumptions. So replacing experiments with natural experiments is not a perfect substitution, but it is a way forward. So replacing experiments with less invasive methods. Second is refining treatments to make them less harmful. So in the context of animal experiments, you wouldn't want the animal to suffer any harm that's unnecessary. And in the context of human experiments, likewise, you wouldn't want the participants to suffer more harm than is necessary. So how can we make our treatments least harmful? Um, and in the context of emotional contagion, <clears throat> they were blocking posts. Um, and so it could, one of the things that critic, one of the criticisms of the experiment was that people could have missed important posts because they were blocked at randomly. And so an alternative <coughs> would have been to use a design that involves boosting. So they could have boosted posts with positive words and boosted posts with negative words. And that would have meant that the posts that were more likely to get knocked out in the feed were the marginal posts near the bottom not the most that were that that Facebook thought were most important. So a boosting design rather than a blocking design might have been less harmful. So that's the second art, refine treatments to make them less harmful. Third, reduce the number of participants. So we only want to use the minimum number of people possible in our experiment to achieve our scientific objectives. Just like you wouldn't want to include tons of unnecessary cats in your experiment you don't want to include tons of unnecessary people in your experiment. So in this case, what they could have, they used a difference in means estimator and they could have used a difference in difference estimator, which is a more efficient statistical approach. So to give an example of this, imagine we were doing a study of weight loss. And so we could take two people, carry a treatment, randomize, a, randomize people into a treatment group and a control group. We could put the treatment group, give them uh, an exercise program, the control group gets no change, and then we measure the average weight in the treatment group and the average weight in the control group after a few months. So what this design though, it, it makes it, so that's one design, that's a difference in means design. A difference in difference design, imagine if instead of um, comparing the weights in the group, we compare the change in weight. So we take the weight of people before, we take the weight of people after, we calculate the change, and then we see whether the change was different in the treatment and the control group. And so it turns out that this approach of comparing change scores reduces a lot of the natural variability in the population, which makes it easier to detect differences with smaller sample sizes. So it's a more efficient design. So how much more efficient? We don't know for sure in this setting. But based on some similar other settings, we think perhaps they could have reduced the number of participants by a half. Um, so that is reduce, reduce the number of participants. So why should we care about reducing the number of participants in minimal risk experiments? So I think we should. We should care about reducing the number of participants for two reasons. First is there is uncertainty about whether the experiment will cause harm. So this particular experiment uh, I think it seems unlikely to me personally that it would have caused a lot of harm to a large number of people. I don't know. Um, but even the people who think the experiment caused no harm, I think have to acknowledge that they are uncertain about the amount of harm or whether anyone would be harmed. So if there is uncertainty about whether there will be harm, then I think it makes sense to try to reduce the number of participants. And the second is that participation was not voluntary. In this case, people were enrolled into the experiment without their consent. So in these situations, uh, I think we should reduce the number of participants as much as possible. To be clear, I don't think it means we should never run experiments uh, where there's uncertainty. And I don't think it means we should never run experiments where participation is not voluntary. I would encourage you to read chapter six of Bit by Bit, the chapter about ethics, or watch those series of videos. But I think if these conditions are met, then we should try to reduce the number of participants as much as we can. So one way to think about all of this, I think, uh, comes from Spider-Man, one of my uh, favorite comic books. So this is the end of the very first Spider-Man and uh, comic book. Peter Parker is there and his Uncle Ben has just died and he walks away into the night and he said, and it says, uh, you know, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. And so I think the three R's uh, are a way of helping us as researchers 
think about that responsibility and take that responsibility seriously. Because now we do have the capability of observing the behavior of millions of, millions of people without their consent and their awareness, enrolling them in experiments without their consent and awareness, and I think we have to use that power responsibly. So the three R's show us that humane methods can also be an opportunity. So potentially these humane methods are more efficient than standard methods. So if I could develop a new technique that would allow researchers to learn from experiments faster, that would be both humane and an advancement in research methodology. Um, I think a pr focusing on humane methods can stimulate interesting research. My favorite example of this is differential privacy. So uh, imagine we want to know whether smoking causes cancer using a bunch of electronic medical records. So there's a lot of reasons why researchers should not have access to those records, the individual level. But the aggregate patterns about are smokers more or less likely to get cancer can be done is likely not privacy violating. So differential privacy is a set of mathematical, statistical, and computer science techniques that allow researchers to learn about aggregate patterns in data without learning about any individual person. It's a very exciting area of research and it shows that a desire for more humane methods can stimulate new research. So that's the end of the video about the three R's and that's the end of this five video series about experiments in the digital age. In the first video, we talked about what are experiments, how digital experiments are similar to and also different from the lab and field experiments that social scientists have done in the past. In the second video, we talked about how you can move beyond simple experiments using ideas from social science to learn more from your experiments. In the third video, we talked about strategies for making it happen, and we talked about four different strategies. In the fourth video, we talked about zero variable cost data in the music lab. And then in this fifth and final video, we talked about the three R's. Thank you.